We will give thanks to you, O Lord, with our whole heart. We will tell of all your wonderful deeds. We will be glad and exult in you. We will sing praise to your name, O Most High. And as we gather together, we know that our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. And now grace to you and peace from God Almighty and Jesus Christ our Lord, through the powerful work of God's Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. With that in mind, please join me in the prayer of confession. O good and forgiving God, Forgive us when we act self-righteously, when we take advantage of another's weakness and vulnerability, when we demand more than we should, and when we make it virtually impossible for others to correct their mistakes. Purge our desire for vindication and dominance, and fill us with your spirit of forgiveness, which knows no limit. We ask all this through Christ our Lord and Savior, 
Amen. People of God, you have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And this is God's gospel promise, to grant us forgiveness of sins and eternal life by grace because of Christ's one sacrifice accomplished on the cross. You are forgiven. God has made you a new creation God has accepted you as God's very own. Believe this, for it is true and it is good news. And then the question is, how do we respond? How do we show our gratitude for God's mercy, love, and forgiveness? Hear these words from Philippians chapter 2. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing of the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Amen. Our Psalter reading is from Psalm 114. When Israel went out from Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of strange language, Judah became God's sanctuary, Israel his dominion. The sea looked and fled, Jordan turned back, the mountains skipped like rams, the hill like lambs. Why is it, O sea, that you flee, O Jordan, that you turn back? O mountains that you skip like rams, O hills like lambs, tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turns the rock into a pool of water, the flint into a spring of water. to all my friends worshiping at home. Some of you started school last week, and some of you will have your first day tomorrow. And whether you are going to school in person or learning virtually at home, I know this year will be different, a year like no other. But as you go into your week, I hope you will all remember to find joy in every day because Jesus is with you wherever you go, whether you're on the school bus, eating your lunch, or learning your lessons at the kitchen table. And now it is time for a word for the children. Do you remember our story from last week? 
we learned that it's important to build bridges instead of fences when we have a disagreement with another person. We need to face conflicts instead of avoiding them. But solving or stopping the problem is only part of what needs to be done. The next step is to forgive. I wonder if my friends at home know what that word means. When we forgive others, we make a decision to stop being hurt and angry, and we move on. We don't just tell the person that everything's okay. We need to decide in our hearts to let things be over. True forgiveness changes us. It's not just about the person who hurt us. That sounds like a hard thing to do, doesn't it? But Jesus tells us that we must. Not only must we forgive, but we may have to keep forgiving over and over. In today's Bible story, Peter asks Jesus, how many times do we need to be ready to forgive someone? And he even makes a suggestion. Peter asks if seven times is enough. And that seems like a lot. What do you think? If someone was unkind to you, do you think you could forgive them for it seven times? It would be tough, wouldn't it? But Jesus tells Peter that even seven times is not enough. Instead, he tells him we need to forgive 77 times, or maybe seven times 70 times. Either way, we need to forgive a lot. Jesus tells us we need to keep forgiving and forgiving as many times as it takes. When we forgive, a burden is lifted from both the one who made the mistake as well as the person who grants forgiveness. Carrying around hurt and anger makes hearts hard. Forgiving sets everyone free. Maybe you think you can't forgive that much. And on your own, you probably cannot. But with the help and strength of God, it's possible. Forgiving is difficult. In fact, this might be the hardest work that God calls us to do. But God is willing to forgive us for our mistakes. And so we must show the same kindness to others. Shall we pray for the strength and patience to forgive Dear God, we are thankful that you love us and forgive us without keeping count. Forgiving those who hurt us can be so hard. Give us the strength to forgive others as you have forgiven us. Amen. This Sunday, during the public worship service on the lawn, we will be dedicating our Sunday school teachers. Uh, Lisa Dudek, Susan Hansen, Monica Hills, Abby Kloptoski, Jen Oliver, and Kelly Clement. If it rains, we will dedicate our Sunday school teachers next Sunday. Uh, please keep them in your prayers for their ministry and important work with our young members. Thank you. Let us give thanks to the Lord with all our being, in the company of the upright. Let us honor God for the blessings and goodness we have received. Let us pray. O God of infinite love and forgiveness, you have given us your spirit of compassion and understanding. Help us to use these spiritual gifts wisely, and help us we shape our world according to your desire. In offering our material gifts today, we also offer ourselves as your servants, overlooking minor differences with others, preserving the goodness of our material world, 
supporting those who work for justice and peace, and forgiving those who act selfishly and harmfully. We thank you for the confidence you place in us as we recommit and dedicate ourselves to your service through the same Spirit who guided Jesus to fulfill your will. Amen. And now hear the word of God. Our first reading is from the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 through 21. Joseph forgives his brothers. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. reading from the epistles, Romans chapter 14, verses 1 through 12, do not judge another. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. Well, those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. Our 
Our gospel reading from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 through 35, forgiveness. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and, and as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave, as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he should pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you, if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On March 6th, 1927, the British philosopher Bertrand Russell delivered a lecture to the National Secular Society, and his lecture was, lecture was aptly called, Why I Am Not a Christian. Russell refers to what he considered to be convincing arguments to reject Christian faith and believe in God. He debunks the so-called first cause argument, the argument from natural law, the design argument, the moral argument, and the argument of remedying of injustice. Now, these were traditional arguments that tried to prove that God exists. His arguments don't bother me, for I have never been convinced that our task is to prove that God exists. Faith, after all, implies a leap. It is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. By the way, the Bible does not start with an introduction that proves that God exists. It simply says, in the beginning when God created. However, I am bothered by his next argument. He argues that the church tells people that they are miserable sinners. And this is what he says, and I quote, contemptible, and not worthy of self-respecting human beings. He says that it's despicable to say that we are sinners and that we need forgiveness. According to him, saying that we are sinners who need forgiveness degrade human beings. So let's think about this for a while. Is it true that admitting that we are sinners degrades us? Or does such honesty liberate us? Does it place a burden on us to admit that we need forgiveness? Or does it enable us to reach our full potential? Russell's optimistic view of humankind is not supported by history. Human history makes it clear that humans, as someone once said, and I quote, have a propensity to spoil things. Forgiveness, on the other hand, has the power to restore, to make whole, to transform, and to free us from guilt, arrogance, and self-centeredness. In fact, forgiveness, according to the Mayo Clinic, has a number of benefits. 
healthier relationships, improved mental health, less anxiety, stress, and hostility, lower blood pressure, fewer symptoms of depression, a stronger immune system, improved heart health, and improved self-esteem. In our Gospel reading, Peter approaches Jesus with an interesting question. How often should I forgive? In Judaism, when you ask someone for forgiveness, he or she is allowed to turn you down. If this happens, you should return a second time. And if you are turned down again, then you should go a third time. This time with three witnesses and ask for forgiveness again. And if the victim won't forgive you after three tries, then you are considered to have atoned, even if you have not been granted forgiveness. Three times. So when Peter therefore asks, should I forgive as many as seven times, he is taking it to another level already. He must have noticed that Jesus is someone who is kind and gentle, someone who is willing to forgive. And then Jesus responds, 77 times. Or as some ancient readings have it, 70 times 7. Now does this mean only 77 times or 490 times? Jesus' answer goes back to Genesis chapter 4, verse 24. And this is what it says in Genesis if Cain is avenged seven times, Lamech will be avenged 70 times seven. And in this chapter, it is about Lamech who takes it upon himself to revenge recklessly and without limits. Without limits. The story of unlimited revenge is linked to the story in Genesis of the increase in sin and the devastating effect increasing sin has on life. So let me remind you that in Genesis, first there is the fall, then a brother who kills his sibling, and now the execution of vengeance which God has reserved for himself. So here we have a situation where humankind is drawn into a vicious, violent, downward spiral. Things are spinning out of control. Jesus, by contrasting forgiveness with unlimited vengeance, in fact is saying that it is forgiveness that slows and stops the vicious cycle of revenge. It is forgiveness that breaks through the vicious cycle of violence and disharmony. Forgiveness is the key in God's kingdom that returns goodness and harmony to humanity. Forgiveness is the break that prevents humanity from sliding into complete chaos. One could also say that it is forgiveness that reboots the broken and violent condition of humankind to return to a condition that is good and harmonious. Forgiveness is God's chosen path to reset things. And therefore, there is no limitation or should not be any limitation to forgiveness. The meaning of the Greek word for forgiveness is fascinating. It literally means release or surrender. Sometimes it means leave in peace. There are instances when it means amnesty, and at times the word means liberation. And as the word evolves, the meaning in the New Testament ultimately refers to God who forgives us in Jesus Christ. We then receive God's peace. We receive amnesty 
and we are liberated from the vicious power of sin and evil. In Christ, according to the New Testament, we are returned to the goodness and harmony that God had in mind at the beginning. In Christ, God resets things. But the concept of forgiveness also evolves in its use in the New Testament. Those who receive forgiveness, those who are restored and liberated, are called to respond by forgiving others. Remember the Lord's Prayer includes these words, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14, we read, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will, will also forgive you. And it is followed by this warning, But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. The parable of the unforgiving servant illustrates how perverse it is when someone who receives forgiveness, someone who is who is re released, does not extend that release to others. It does not make sense. And it is easy to blame the servant as an awful human being. And yet we have to confess that we sometimes do the same. We who have received forgiveness, who are made whole by, the receiving, by receiving God's peace, we don't always forgive others. We defend our unwilling, unwillingness with a seemingly rational and even wise response, like, no one should expect me to forgive this person. People of God, the importance of forgiveness cannot be overstated. I don't think it's taking it too far to state that a willingness to forgive is the litmus test whether we understand, really understand what it means that God has forgiven us. All of us have a rather strong reaction when we read this parable. How can it be that someone who has forgiven so much can refuse to forgive so little? Now, anyone who truly understands God's grace, God's unconditional love, God's unlimited mercy, and God's boundless forgiveness will not hesitate to do the same by letting go, by forgiving others, by starting new and starting over. Someone has pointed out that human beings have three options in this life. Three options. The first option is to return harm for harm, to proliferate pain in the world by indulging in, in every petty act of revenge or cruelty. In this option, forgiveness does not play a role. The second option is to hide our passions, beat them down, deny them, and cover our strong emotions with masks of rationality and cold logic. Forgiveness is ignored or by cold reasoning made optional. But then there is a third option. And we can take the terrible risk, the terrible risk of accepting our passions and allowing God to do the work of transforming them into the love and joy that properly forms the human soul. And the key to this transformation is forgiveness. Forgiveness is the choice to accept pain inflicted by another and to refuse to return that pain upon the perpetrator. It is a choice to end the cycle of violence and the spread of hurt. This choice goes against our natural instincts to refuse to return harm for harm. The only thing that makes this possible is love. Love opens up a new option of finding healing and turning the pain from the agent of evil to the use of good. Love does not remove pain from one's life or protect one from hurt. Indeed, sometimes the choice to forgive will mean that we will suffer more. 
Instead of returning hurt for hurt, love absorbs the hurt and returns good. Far from protecting or eliminating pain from the life of the one who loves, the response of love can leave one terribly vulnerable. One is not left defenseless, however, because although it may not initially seem so, the power of forgiveness is powerfully compelling to the forgiven. The one who is forgiven is also transformed and made whole. The one who forgives, the one who loves, is transformed away from the natural instinct to hurt, and he or she becomes more Christ-like. Jesus on the cross took the full painful consequences of the natural and vicious human response on him. Jesus embraced the vulnerability of love, absorbed every pain that evil and human cruelty could muster, and he chose forgiveness. In doing so, he conquered the desires that in humans had been turned to evil. Christ then became the guide for all who would follow him, for he showed us another path and he guides us on that path. And we must now take up our cross and follow Jesus in the same path of sacrificial love. The path of love and forgiveness is a longer, harder road than the simple one of survival called for by natural instinct. Love is the gift of divine grace in our life. But no path is harder than the path of true love. For love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. The love that will not bear pain is no love at all. And forgiveness, where no pain has been suffered, is not forgiveness. It is when we forgive, that the cycle of violence and hate is ended. Let me repeat that. It is when we forgive that the cycle of violence and hate is ended. It is through forgiveness that we are reconciled with God and able to start over. It is when we forgive that we serve God's kingdom, sharing God's mercy, and grace with others. So even though Bertrand Russell was a good philosopher, he simply was wrong when he argued that it is bad for our self-esteem when we acknowledge that we need forgiveness. We do need forgiveness, and we need to forgive. What we need in our world is actually more forgiveness, not less. Amen. Let us now affirm our faith in the living God in these words. We are God's stewards. We belong to Jesus Christ and to each other. We are not ashamed of the good news about Christ. He is God's powerful method of bringing all who believe to celebrate the victory of his life, death, 
and resurrection. We believe we are involved in the struggle of life and death. We choose life. We affirm it. We believe the triumph of God's way is assured. We are building on God's plan, and we believe it reveals the life that God would give to all. We are confident that God will give us enduring worth. We are ready to live and die in Christ's love for us. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, for it is holy and right to do so. Loving and forgiving God, you are the one we call upon, for you are the one who created us the one who calls us, and the one who is willing to start over with us. Hear us now and bring deliverance and renewal to our lives and community. Bring deliverance from ways of relating to one another that seek only one's own advantage and not the greater good. Heal wounds we carry deep within or sometimes on our sleeves. Invigorate your servant people to re be responsible and take care of this creation fashioned by your hands. Support those who would be peacemakers, the ones who care for vulnerable ones of any age or station. Frustrate those whose aim is injustice and whose means are without ethics save that of sheer power. We pray for your spirit to move us to forgive others as we ourselves have been forgiven. Help us to respond to a world of hate and prejudice with love so great that it will lead to a new beginning. We pray for your world. We still remember those innocent people who were killed in the terrorist attacks on September 11, 19 years ago. Be with their loved ones. Comfort them. We give you thanks for Jesus who showed us a new way to deal with retaliation and hatred. Help us to walk the path of Jesus so that the cycle of violence is broken. We pray for each and every member and friend of our congregation. Embrace us with your love, stir us with your spirit, and give us courage and strength to forgive. Be with those who are sick. We pray for Carolyn Cromer. Craig DeRusso, Sharon and Bob Ryder. We give you thanks that Sharon is home again after a stay in hospital. We pray, O oh God, for our homebound members, for refugees, especially those on the Greek island of Lesbos who lost everything in fires. We pray for victims of violence and victims of natural disasters, especially the victims of the terrible fires on the West Coast. Be with the dangerous people in the dangerous places in the world. Bring peace and reconciliation and move people to forgive. Be with our leaders and the challenges we face as a country internally and externally. Make us instruments in your service to bring your grace and mercy to others. We pray this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying in one voice, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God Almighty, and the communion of the Holy Spirit will be with you now and forevermore. Amen.